So I'll be working on three fourths of the time. Like, okay, so this week I've already got the next four weeks. And this week God did that thing that annoys me where he interrupts what I'm trying to work on. He interrupts what I want to tell you. You know what I'm saying? Don't you hate that? Oh God, I got something to say. And uh, it was very, because, you know, we're in this series. I'm trying to transition to our to our uh, series on Believers in Babylon. And it got to the point where I was, I mean, up to Thursday. Because, uh, like, even the idea that kind of dropped my spirit in prayer a couple of days before. And I was like, okay, well, I'll just kind of include that in. And, he was, and by the last two days, it was very clear, like, no, you're not including this in. I need you to go ahead and drop this on them tonight. So, basically... October 2nd, Sunday, October 2nd is uh, Rosh Hashanah uh, or Zikron, uh, tr Feast of uh, Trumpets. And so, you know, I'm like, okay, so next week, bam, I already got this. I'm already setting up the sermon for next week. I know that we'll be talking about the, the, the Feast of Trumpets next week. Well, I'm ready. And God kept pushing it back. And I'm like, well, no, because it's not till next week, God. It's not till next week. I don't understand why. And it was very clear that he wanted that to be a part of tonight's sermon. So for those who are wondering if you feel like I'm trying to get ahead of the game or be early, trust me, I wasn't. So I do believe that it is a word in season. Amen? Amen. Now, note 1A. Note 1A. Leviticus 23. Yahweh spoke to Moses saying, In the seventh month on the first day, you shall have a zikron pru'ah, a remembrance of blowing of trumpets. A remembrance of blowing of trumpets. Now, some people don't recognize the Feast of Trumpets because it's actually known by its uh, civil name as a Rosh Hashanah, first of the year or head of the year, literally Rosh Head Hashanah of the year. Feast of Trumpets is also known as Rosh Hashanah, the biblical new year, which starts not tomorrow night, but the next, next Sunday. So it's almost like maybe with this whole no bounce back thing, God is going to kind of, kind of do some early blessings. Maybe God is bringing some things a little bit quicker. Amen? Father, tonight as the word comes forth, Lord God, let it be a power demonstration of the Spirit. Father, we know that your ways are higher than our ways, your thoughts are higher than our thoughts. So we just ask, Father, that we would all just submit to your word and to your order. In Yeshua's name, amen. amen. So, so whether, so the reason why, if you're reading your Bible, it's like, well, why, why are they always talking about Rosh Hashanah? I don't see Rosh Hashanah in the Bible. It's because it's known by its other name, Yom Zikaron, okay? Feast of Trumpets. Now, this is very, very fascinating. Let's look at note 2A, Feast of Trumpets, in Exodus chapter 19, 19. Now remember, children of Israel have been in captivity for uh, over 400 years. Now, God, we got us brought them out of Egypt. Hallelujah, we can sing the glory. But then it wasn't simply, I'm going to bring you out of Egypt, then I'm going to leave you there. Notice, God brought them out to bring them up. God brought them out to then bring them up, but before he could bring them up, he had to meet with them. So this is very interesting. What happens when Yahweh got his sins on the mountain? This is the stuff that I could just sit and lay back like, like, you, like seriously, like God just put a king on a mountain and just in front of the entire nation of Israel? Like, okay, now think about it when he just comes and splits the sky and we see him face to face, okay? Trust me, I do not believe that people really understand how important this, this event is. The coming and the return of the Lord. Now think about how much glory it was. Like, you know, the, there's a black cloud and all this, uh, you know, thick darkness and God sits on the, on the mountain. But what about, but, but see, there's a few select people that kind of saw some of his glory. But it says, behold, he comes with the clouds and every eye will see him. But not just a figure or an image, you will see Yahweh God, Yeshua the Son coming. But let's back up to Exodus 19. It says, when the sound of the trumpet sounded, Moses spoke and God answered him by a voice. Now, what's also interesting, uh, and God descended. Yahweh, he was sitting in the highest of the highest of the highest of the highest above the heavens. He descends upon Mount Sinai, called Moses, and then Moses ascended. 
See the analogy? The sound of the trumpet. By the way, it says this word right here, cold in Hebrew, answered by a voice. Cold. Same voice for the sound, same voice for, for trumpet. Cold. The voice, the voice, the sound, the sound, the voice. This is the hour where you need to start tuning your ears more to hearing the voice and the sound of God. More than the sound of the world, more than the sound of your own flesh, which is a distraction. Make sure in this hour you understand. Listen, there's people like, why haven't I ascended? Why haven't I gone up further in the spirit? Because you're not listening to his voice. It is his voice that brings you up, not your voice. We got that? His voice. Make sure you are paying attention to his voice. So, Yahweh descends. And Moses ascended. So what's significant? You got a trumpet, you got a voice, you got ascension, and then you got ascension. Watch. Note to me. First Thessalonians chapter 4. The Lord will descend from heaven with the voice of the archangel and with the what? What? Wait for everybody else. Trumpet of God. Then we who are alive shall be caught up. Yahweh comes down, we go up. What's happening? Same picture. A voice, a trumpet. Descension of God, ascension of the people to meet the Lord in the air. So what's happening is, Titus 2.13, note 3.8. Looking for, and this is the question. See, I like how the writer, he says this as if he assumes everyone's on the same page. But the reality is, most people aren't looking for this. Most people are looking for the next paycheck, or you're looking for the next meeting, or you're looking for the next encounter, or you're looking for the next opportunity. But looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior. Jehovah's Witnesses love this verse. That's a joke, by the way. No, they can't stand this verse because they call Jesus God and Savior. The blessed hope. Now, remember, when we say hope, we think like, hey, man, I need to go talk to Steve. I hope he has my money, right? Our definition of hope isn't really rooted in a strong faith. It's like, I hope maybe it might. But when scriptures say hope, this Greek word elpis is more of an expectation, so understand this expectation. Here's the point. We are going to look at four expecta Rosh Hashanah expectations. So here's the first one. So Feast of Trumpets, or first Rosh Hashanah, first of the year. What do they have in common? It is possible that the Lord will return at Rosh Hashanah at the sounding of the trumpets. Most people believe that, that is when Yeshua will come back. The picture, when he comes, he is not coming without a trumpet. Amen? So, now, remember, I don't get dogmatic on this stuff. So I'm not telling you he has to come in this day. I'm simply saying there are certain connections and the writer gives us clues on it very well possibly be that it could be Rosh Hashanah. Now, note 4A. This word hope is what I hope we get in our spirits tonight. This word hope is what I hope we get in our spirit tonight. Paul says this in Acts chapter 26. He says, I am judged for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. I am judged for the hope of the promise God made to our fathers. What was that promise? This promise, note 4b, is the answer. To this promise, our 12 tribes, earnestly serving God night and day, hope to attain. Why should you think it's incredible that God resurrects the dead? Why do you think it is bizarre? I'm, I'm amazed at people who have a problem believing with God and God because they don't believe that he can do miraculous things. That is the point of believing in God. He is miraculous. He is the giver of life. However, there are some people that think it's just impossible that God would raise the dead. Now, people will make this um, mistake of confusing Pharisees and Sadducees together. 
Well, Pharisees and Sadducees are the same thing. No, there's a reason why Paul still called himself a Pharisee. People aren't paying attention. He still called himself a Pharisee. Why? Why is it that when Paul spoke, there would be a division between the Pharisees and the Sadducees? The Sadducees would have a problem, but most of the Pharisees would be like, well, hold on, let them talk, let them talk. Let them. Why is that? Who knows the difference? Acts chapter 23, verse 8. The Sadducees do not believe in the resurrection. They do not believe in angels. They do not believe in spirit. But the Pharisees confess all of them. There are some people that do not believe that God actually resurrects the dead. There have been people who I see come to altar calls. I've taken them in the back room. And I'm explaining to them, hey, I just want you to make sure you know what you've done. I want to understand the decision you made. And one gentleman, as I'm explaining to him, like, so you understand that Jesus rose from the dead? He says, what? Jesus rose from the dead? You came to an altar call? This is why we have to be faithful and consistently preaching the gospel that other people might be bored about. Some people really do not believe there is a resurrection. So don't take it for granted. Why should you think that it's incredible that God resurrects the dead? Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, note 4c. We shall not sleep. We shall all be changed in a moment at the last, say it with me, trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible. Once again, feast of trumpets, Rosh Hashanah, the trumpet has two things involved. The first uh, Rosh Hashanah expectation is the coming of the Lord. But the second needs to be the resurrection of our bodies. Note 4D. Yeshua's resurrection promises that he will also resurrect our bodies when he returns. So don't just take this as another quote unquote Jewish holiday. I want people of God to have an expectation. Regardless of whether or not he comes, Next Sunday night or not, that's not the point. The point is he will come. You need to throw your shut up. Feast trumpet is a reminder that there is a day when he will come. But the second thing is, okay, well, that's good for him, but it's also good for us. Because the second thing is that there will be a resurrection. Rosh Hashanah needs to be an understanding that he will resurrect the rise. That trumpet, that feast of trump, that trumpet will sound, and it's a confirmation of our resurrection. Amen? Note 5a. Somebody say, keep hope alive. <laughs> I've called you, note 5a, I've called for you to, to see you and speak with you because for the hope of Israel, I am bound with this chain. For the hope of Israel, I'm bound with this chain. Now remember, the uh, incarceration of Paul is twofold. So some people would like to say, well, it's because, you know, Paul's persecuted for his faith, preaching Jesus. Well, it's a little deeper than that. Hold on. Note 5b, Ephesians 2. Gentiles, at one time, you were without Christ, having no hope and without God. Paul says, I am here for the hope of Israel. This is why I have this chance. Then Paul reminds people also in Ephesians chapter 2 that you, without Christ, you were the ones who did not have hope because you were the ones without Christ. Now, Jews, Gentiles, the battle was raging back and forth in the first century, extremely violent. I am not desensitized to the nonstop, week after week parading of division that is taking place in our own culture. We're not in Israel, we're not in Jerusalem. It has happened here in our country. It is time for the people of God to start preaching the right hope. Stop preaching the Jews versus the Gentiles, the blacks versus the whites, the policemen versus the, that's not the gospel. We need to preach the right hope. The hope that he is coming. The hope that he is going to resurrect our bodies. When I'm watching the news, which I literally try to not do, 
And someone will say, hey, did you hear about this? Hey, did you do that? This week, I was faced with this unfortunate reality. So basically, every time someone gets shot, we're just going to burn up stuff. Every time. So, so basically, this is now the new American expectation. So now our hope, our expectation is just we're just waiting for the next person to get shot and the next riot and the next city that's shut down and the next uh, military coup that rises up. To, like, wait, that, that's what God intends? No, absolutely not. So in the same way as there is drama between Jew and Gentile, that's what's happening here in our own country. But love hopes all things. Love hopes all things. This division, the spirit of murder, the spirit of death, the spirit of racism, the spirit of, of, of just compartmentalization, all Black people like this, all white people like this, all police officers like this, that has got to go. Love, love hopes all things. We have to make sure we're doing our part as leaders to restore the hope back to our communities. So everyone else can use this as an excuse to say, well, I'm mad because this person did this, or I'm mad because this. But what about the hope in Christ that says, you know what? I am going to choose to love. So the name of tonight's message is called Messianic Motivation. Note 5b. Yeshua is the only hope for peace between Jews and Gentiles by showing love for all humanity. That's our job. Our job is not to pick sides, but his side. But the problem is, it's easier to join the side of offense than to fight for reconciliation and unity. It's easier to be offended. It's easier to be upset. It's easier to be emotional and agitated than it is to fight for unity. Note 6a, Paul gives us this challenge. He says, endeavoring. That's what like the King James knew. So I want to get that Greek word there. Diligent exertion. What I am not saying is a diligent exertion on the part of people to say, listen, I know what happened is jacked up, but I'm still not going to use that as an excuse to destroy, divide our nation. Mm-hmm. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. But the problem is, it's not the world's fault. If the church is not leading by example, showing what it means to fight for unity. So if all of a sudden we get more political, then kingdom minded. We need to be motivated by the love of the Messiah above all things. Endeavoring, diligent exertion to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body. Just as you were called in one, say with me, hope of your calling. So here's the reality. When I look at these pictures, and I'm noticing, because remember, discrimination, hate, is is colorblind. Anybody from any side can pick up an offense. Anybody from any side can be offended for any reason, for any purpose. It doesn't matter who you are. If you've got a heart, you are subject to bitterness, discrimination, and hate. But when I saw this sign right here, that is supposed to be, I hope that is what every believer in the body of the Messiah will be able to say. All this hatred, all this fighting, we are not this. That is not who I am. That is not who the Messiah is. That's supposed to be our role. Now I'm all for standing up for justice. But not in the name of politics. Not in the name of revenge. So when it talks about endeavoring to keep the human spirit, 
for, for the hope of your call. Well, how are we able to do this? How is this going to happen? Note 6b. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. That is how you are able to diligently exert the discipline, the character, and the integrity to fight for the unity that God's people need. So that means if you are saved, Romans 8 says if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he's not of his. So that means if you are born again, you have the spirit of Christ, and you do not have an excuse to act like an idiot in Jesus' name. Amen. Note 6C. So the third expectation. So the first expectation, the first hope, we're using that word hope, or we're interpreting what it means, expecting that God will come, the Messiah will come, Yahweh will come. The second is that he will resurrect our bodies. But here's the third expectation, because he says, endeavor, striving diligent to keep the unity of the spirit. Everyone called in Christ is expected to fight for peace. Not to fight one another. Fight for peace. Make sure you're doing your part to not agitate the situation, but promote reconciliation. So like I said, the first half of, the, of, of Paul, he said, for the hope of Israel, I'm in this chain. And then on purpose, we talked about, then Paul switches and he's saying like, you know, remember Gentiles, you at one time were without Christ, you were the ones without hope. So I wanna kind of conclude here with these next few slides and pay attention to this story. Here in Acts chapter 22, what you have is Paul is now speaking to a multitude of, of, of Hebrew people. And, and uh, when they, they find out that he can uh, speak in the Hebrew tongue, you know, they're quiet and listening to him. And uh, it says here, as Paul starts recounting the events of how he came to faith in the Messiah, he said, as I journeyed and came near Damascus, Suddenly a great light from heaven shone around me, and I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So I asked, who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Yeshua of Nazareth. Now, two things I want to be clear on this, this story. It's very important to understand that one, uh, there's, you got Acts chapter 9, you got Acts chapter 22. And like I've heard some people... If you haven't run into this, you will run into this. There's people that are basically ready to ostracize Paul and discount Paul and call him a false apostle. And literally, that came up in like my third Hebrew class. Like, I didn't know the guy that I was teaching was like an anti-missionary at the time. And it was just like, and then just out of nowhere, he just started ripping up Paul. I'm like, wait, what, 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 what's happening? And so one of the things that they'll try and use is supposed contradiction in the Bible. Now, keep in mind, the reason why the scriptures make sense is because in Acts chapter 9, Paul is not telling the story. It's the writer Luke. So there are going to be certain things that Luke is going to see or point out that Paul's not going to say. In Acts chapter 22, this is Paul's version of the story. So it's not a contradiction. If you go back to Acts chapter 9, you see certain things. Remember, it's two different versions of the same story. It's not a contradiction. It is a, what's my word, what's my word? Paradox. Okay. So, he heard a voice saying, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So I asked, who are you, Lord? He said to me, I am Yeshua of Nazareth. Now, remember, this is important. This is Paul, a Jewish man, speaking to a whole bunch of other Jews. They are not mad that he's talking about Jesus. They're not mad that he's talking about the, um, that, that, that Jesus says that he was persecuting them. So there's a, still this false narrative that Jews had a problem with Jesus. And that's why Paul was in jail. But that is not true. And note 7 eight, continuing in Acts chapter 22. Then he said to me, I will send you far from here to the Gentiles. And they listened to him until until what, class? They listened to him when, when he was saying, talking about Jesus. They didn't have a problem with him talking about Jesus. What did they have a problem with? 
They had a problem with him talking about the Gentiles. Then they said, away with such a man, he is not fit to live. That's why I'm saying the message of racial reconciliation it doesn't begin with the black people and the white people. It begins with the Jew and the Gentile. This is the root. So this is why Paul said in Ephesians chapter 3, Paul, a prisoner for you Gentiles. Paul's a prisoner not because he was preaching Jesus. Paul's a prisoner because he endeavored to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace and reach out to other people. This is the heart of reconciliation. But as we conclude here with this theme of being a prisoner, Zechariah chapter 9, because the blood of your covenant, I will set your prisoners free. Mm. Return to the stronghold. Let me be 100% biased right now. The stronghold for the people of God is the kingdom of God. That which represents in the church and the synagogues. The kingdom of God. To not be committed to the kingdom of God is forsaking the stronghold. To be more attached to personal agendas, to be more attached to political agendas, other than the priority and the necessity of the kingdom of God. The stronghold of God's people is not outside of the kingdom of God. Return to the stronghold, you prisoners of hope. Return to the stronghold, you prisoners of hope. Those who in the faith don't need to first run to CNN and Fox News and all this other stuff. We need to return to the stronghold. We need to come back to our roots in the faith, but also come back to our community in the kingdom of God. And then he says, Hyom, today I declare I will restore double to you. For those who don't understand what's happening, this is God now giving you a promise. Returning to the stronghold. And then he says, today I will restore double to you. Paul, a prisoner. For fighting for reconciliation. For ministering to the Gentiles. That is where some of us can feel like I'm trying to to do the right thing. I'm trying to preach. I'm trying to be faithful. I'm trying to seek the kingdom of God. But I just feel like it's always hopeless. I feel like it's just almost like a prison. But God has a word for you today that you can be free from the prison of hopelessness and find yourself a prisoner of the expectation in Christ. Now remember, it's by the blood of the covenant, Right? Note 8b, the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. He broke and said, take eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. He also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. When 1 Corinthians says, excuse me, when 2 Corinthians says that all the promises in him are not yes and no, but they're yes and amen. Every single person better get the promise of Zechariah chapter 9, because that was a promise. The reason why you know that can apply to you is because now the new covenant is in his blood. And if you are washed in his blood, then you have the access to the promise of God in the Messiah. Today, he's offering you double. Amen? So we have, there's a saying, you know, let's not kill that. And uh, what they normally say during this time of year for Rosh Hashanah. Um, and another way that is communicated is it says, may you be inscribed in the book of life for a good year. So the belief is that 
Edward Rosie Sana, you know, God sees the year ahead, and uh, God writes certain things down on your behalf for a good year. Who had an okay year last year? Who had an awful year last year? Who had a great year last year? What is happening? You either had a great year, an okay year, an awful year. Well, let's start again. Did anybody have a bad year last year? Just, it was just rough. Okay, well, well that's okay. Why, are we embarrassed now? That's all right. Things could have been better. But here's the point. There's a promise from the Word of God. The spirit of discouragement, the spirit of disappointment, is that now, this new season, it's time to have an expectation that you're going to have a good year. Regardless of how frustrating or just disappointing or just frustrating it was, this is the opportunity to take God at his word. And I come before God in Yeshua's name by the blood of the covenant. And I'm asking for all of the things, listen, all the discouragement, all the disappointment, I don't expect that because last year is over. I'm ready for the new year. Amen? Note 8C. Here's the point. The blood of Yeshua's covenant releases you from any prison of hopelessness. Any prison of hopelessness. So here's what happens. Those who had a bad year, you have a bad year, frustrated year, and then all of a sudden you're like, well, I guess this is how it's always going to be. And you're really dogged by your past. And all of a sudden it's like hope just seeps out of you. But faith in the blood of the covenant, faith in what Yeshua has done for you, faith restores the expectation of God's goodness. Receive the hope for a good year today in Yeshua's name. People are at each other's throats because there's no hope. The country is being literally ripped apart. There's just no one, no one hope. All that quote unquote hope and change. <laughs> or, or as I like to call, nope and strange. <laughs> it has been the most bizarre eight years I've ever seen. Legislatively, spiritually, the demonology that's off the charts, the obviously the the sexual promiscuity, you name it. It has been eight years of just what? Strange. But that's a false hope. And anytime the world puts their hope in a man instead of Adam and I, you are going to have disappointment. <clears throat> Receive the hope for a good year in Yeshua's name. So this is what, in conclusion, I want to leave you with. So remember what he said, today, 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 today. Zechariah, he said, today I will restore the devil. Paul makes his promise. Romans 15, verse 13, says now, now, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace. Anybody can use more joys and peace? Talking about the new you. That you may abound in hope by the power of the Spirit. That's what I'm believing with you and for you. This Rosh Hashanah. I don't care what the circumstances are. I don't care what the situation is. We can all go through the list. Well, this happened, this happened. But if you ain't got hope, if your expectation is, well, that's just how it's always been and it's never going to know, it's time to have the expectation for a good year.